I'm going to read a passage in Isaiah chapter 6. I'm not sure if it's a Pentecost passage, but we'll visit it again at the end of the sermon. Um, because it's appropriate to do so. Isaiah writes, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Now before I read the text of Pentecost Sunday, I would like us to open up our imaginations to a possible conversation that was going on with the disciples that was never written down. Uh, um, it might sound like I'm writing the scripture myself, but uh, who cares? Jesus ascended 40 days after the resurrection up into heaven, but before he left, he gave his disciples a job to do. And remember what he said? You go to the ends of the earth and tell them about me. And then he sent them to Jerusalem and told them to wait. Ten days later, the spirit of Pentecost came and the church was birthed. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But there were ten days there. And if these guys were anything like us, if, if they were, you know homebodies or people who preferred a little less adventure. I imagine some of the conversation they had in those 10 days when they got together. They were raised as Jews. They were Jewish followers of Christ and they were raised to think in their own religion that the Gentiles were dirty and untouchable. They were raised to see the rest of the world as outside the bounds of God's kingdom. The problem for them, however, is that Jesus kept telling them that is precisely why he came, to save the, the world. So I imagine for the ten days after the ascension, when they got together to talk, the conversation went something like this. Hey, Peter, I was thinking that you would be the right one to go to the Samaritans and tell them about Jesus. Really, James? I was thinking that Andrew would be the one. He kind of looks like a Samaritan. No way, Andrew says. They scare me. How about James and John? They can go together. And James and John, if you know them, say almost in unison, Oh, we would, but Mom doesn't want us to. <laughs> Jude pops up in the conversation. Do you really think he meant go to Samaria and the ends of the earth? You know, he loved to tell stories and parables. Thaddeus, what do you think? You've been quiet. Well, says Thaddeus, I was just thinking. If you look at the Greek words Jesus used and apply a different hermeneutical principle to exegete them, we could obey in principle and not actually have to leave home. Thaddeus, says Peter, Shut up. <laughs> okay, guys, let's draw straws or something. Hey, Philip, you lose. We chose you to go to the ends of the earth. Well, I'm not going. I have a family here. How about Bartholomew or Thomas? I know, says Levi. Let's be like Jesus. Let's make some of our own disciples, and we will send them to the uttermost part of the earth. And that's the great idea, and they all agree, because the last thing they really want to do is leave Jerusalem and go out there and touch those people. Well, that's my vision of the conversation. But let's read what actually happened in Acts. Luke writes, beginning in chapter 1 with verse 1. 
the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up into heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and they said oh good we like Jerusalem and in Judea and they said okay we can do that and then he said into Samaria and the, their, their smiles turned upside down and he said even to the remotest parts of the earth chapter 2 verse 1 when the day of Pentecost had come they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues languages really tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from, highlight, every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. The Greek word there for language is dialectos. Hear the word dialect there. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born? Our mother tongues. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, and Jews, and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? Others were mocking and saying, They're full of sweet wine. But Peter said, Well, it's a little early in the day for that. Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all flesh, all people, your sons and your daughters, your grandparents, all flesh. Let us pray. Lord, since the day of Pentecost, sincere seekers have asked, what does it mean? What does it mean that we hear your mighty deeds in our own language? Pray that you would open our hearts to hear you this morning. Amen. If you were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and you were a proselyte to Judaism, maybe a Jewish believer from a foreign land,
you would have definitely already had learned some Greek and possibly some Aramaic or Hebrew. Greek was the language of the Roman Empire of trade and had you traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, or even if you'd lived there most of your life, Greek would have been the language you used to study the Scripture. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures or the Septuagint would have been what you read and what you heard read in your daily life. Those who gathered that day in Jerusalem had never heard the wonders of God proclaimed in any language other than Greek or possibly Hebrew or Aramaic. So when this miracle happened, they were immediately drawn to the sound of the wind and the sound of the languages of their birth, the languages of their homelands. Now there are many, many different people groups in California and if we just think of the, the Hispanic people groups, how many different dialects of Spanish would you find even in this area? And if you were from a small village somewhere in, in southern Mexico and your village had a particular dialect to it, and you were walking through the mall and you heard somebody speaking Spanish with that dialect, it would be like a magnet to your soul. Right? You would probably stop what you were doing and go and find out who is speaking my particular language. And so it is in Acts that the languages of their births drew them to ask what in the world is going on. And as they come around the corner hearing the words of God proclaimed in their birth languages, expecting to see people like them, they see a bunch of Galileans. It might have been last Pentecost I mentioned that Galileans are the, the equivalent in ancient Israel of rednecks in modern day America. Galilean would greet you with something like, hey y'all, how, how you doing? And, and uh, you don't remember that sermon? I'll preach it again next Sunday. It would have been a wonderful and amazing thing to see and to hear. Now do you think a kid, a child, can pick out their own mother's voice in a crowd of voices? You know they can. So too these worshipers in Jerusalem, they cut through all the noise of the crowd and are drawn to their mother tongues. And Luke lists the peoples. Before he makes the list, he says every nation under heaven. And then he says Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. These are the people groups there from what is modern day Iran. And then he says the residents of Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq really, and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, Pamphylia, which is Turkey in that area. Then Asia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Cretans, the Greek islands, Arabs. Luke is basically saying everybody was in town with a sweep of his hand. It is a wonderful group of ethnicities and nationalities. And I wonder when they heard the words of God in their birth languages, what they heard. Now when you are away from home in another land, and you are conversing with people and you don't speak the language, it's difficult. But if you're in another country and you hear somebody speaking your English, it creates instant affinity. A few years ago, we went to, uh, on a little Mediterranean cruise and we stopped in uh, Catacolon, Greece. The moment we got off the boat, all of my seminary Greek went right out the window. It didn't work for me at all. And so we walked through the streets of Catacolon into the shops, uh, silently, just smiling at people, until we took a side street and we walked into one shop there uh, on the side. And when we walked in, somebody greeted us in English. But it wasn't just English, it was American English. And it wasn't just American English, it was California English. <laughs> And we walked in and suddenly we were best friends with this person we'd never met. This person from Santa Barbara who owned a store in Catacolon, Greece. Needless to say, we spent a little bit of money in that shop. 
she was from Santa Barbara, which was interesting. We were, we were friends. We spent a little money. We bought on this Italian cruise some authentic Greek, Greek trinkets from a Californian, likely made in China. That, that didn't come out as smooth as it was written, but you get the picture, right? Now, these foreign worshipers that day in Jerusalem were drawn like a magnet to the apostles as they heard what must have been the gospel in their mother tongues. The mighty deeds of God, it says in your text, mighty can mean magnificent or splendid. And what is more splendid than the deed of God in coming to earth for our salvation? Many of them came to faith that day and received the same baptism in the Spirit. But to me, more important than what they heard, what the Spirit was actually saying to them, was what God was exhibiting to the world, to us, to the disciples, by speaking in their native languages. What God was saying in this was more than simple inclusion of the others, of the outsiders, of the ethnicities. God was actually communicating respect and honor to those people and to their peoples. The fire and wind and miracle of languages was the Holy Spirit's exclamation point to Jesus' command to go into all the world. And you can almost hear the apostles talking back to Jesus saying, well, we can't go into all the world. We don't even speak their languages. Christ promised them the power to be witnesses on this day. He literally delivers that power. The power to tell God's story in another tongue. And if Pentecost shows us anything, it shows us this rainbow of, of color. It shows us an intentional including of those that were different to bring every tribe and every tongue into the community of faith. If the miracle was only about the message, the Spirit could have communicated it more effectively in Greek. But it was not so much just the message as the method. The Spirit chose the languages of the miracle to be the native tongues of the gathered people. What does it mean when you choose to engage someone intentionally in their native language? It means you honor them. If you go to the trouble with, when in the presence of other people groups to speak words from their native tongue, they're almost always honored by your effort. It is saying, I respect you, I value you, I value your heritage, your beginnings, your people, your culture. When English-speaking peoples from America and across the Atlantic travel, we seem to run into English all the time. The signs and, and recordings. It is the language, our language, is the language of trade and international travel. It's never been too difficult for me to find someone to converse with in English. But imagine if you were to just drop down in San Francisco and all you spoke was Greek. About the only thing you'd get excited about was seeing a Euro restaurant somewhere, you know. In this miracle of language, God is honoring the visitors the foreigners. And they ask, why are they speaking in our native languages? The languages of our birth. Hearing God being praised in their mother tongues, they want to know the meaning of this. And Peter stands up and says, this is what was spoken by the prophet. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people, men and women, Boys and girls, young and old alike, will prophesy. God was not just delivering the gospel. He was honoring the people, the language, the homeland of those he delivered it to. After all, Jesus kept saying, he came for the world. And how nice it would be if that day... The day of the church's birth, the day of Pentecost, the church had learned that lesson and never looked back. But here's a news flash. The church has always been full of hard-headed people. Not this one, right? But all those other churches. The church has a tendency in history to miss 
the point. But I believe the church is coming back around to an understanding of Pentecost. I've started a doctoral program, many of you know, and the books that I am reading are just filled with something called post-colonial theological thought. And because I'm reading about it, you all are going to hear about it. That's just pretty much how that goes. It, it, it seems in this post-colonial theological thought that the voices of once dominated people groups are finally finding significant voice in our theological institutions. And this is a good thing. And it's very important. These once colonially dominated peoples finding their theological voice harkens back to the miracle in Acts where God through the Holy Spirit gave voice to different people groups. Validating not just their language but the people themselves. When God brought forth the minor languages of the earth to express his wonderful deeds. And as I begin to read and listen to these post-colonial theologians, these post-colonial voices, I confess that it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to pause and listen to the stories of so many people groups dispossessed by so many forces from the West. Forces that came to take resources, to enslave other human beings, and believe it or not, simultaneously to bring the gospel. It is one of those times when you read the words of Christ and then you look at Christian history and you wonder how so many could do so much harm in the name of Christ. What were they thinking? So far in my studies, I'm barely scratching the surface of this huge body of post-colonial theory. It's a big field and an important conversation. But everything I read keeps taking me back to Acts. Back to Christ and His command to go into all the world and bring good news like love and justice and peace. Not imperial decree, ethnic division, and conflict. As on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit would never have us silence the voices from people's homelands. The Spirit speaks through those voices still, just as on the day of Pentecost. Brianne handed me a note after the first service that said, and I haven't looked it up, maybe you know, today there are over 9,000 languages on earth. Within 10 years, some people estimate that 90% of them will be gone. What do you lose when you lose a language? Peter's explanatory epiphany to the crowd that day is, this is what Joel prophesied. I will send my spirit on all people. All people. Peter's newly confessed miracle of Pentecost and newly experienced Christian inclusiveness unfortunately was fairly short-lived. Like so much of church history, Peter clearly hears and understands what the Spirit is saying and what the Spirit is doing, and yet it is not long at all before the church degrades and begins to shut those foreign voices out. In Acts 6, we read this, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And we see the ethnic division begin to creep into the early church. Then in Acts 10, Peter struggles to take the good news to a godly Roman centurion named Cornelius, but the Spirit of Christ says to him three times, Do not call unholy what I have called holy. Do not call unclean what I have cleansed. Peter, in obeying, takes the gospel to Cornelius and is astonished. This blows my mind. In Acts 10, Peter says, The very same Spirit that fell on us 
fell on them. And I want to say, Peter, haven't you read Joel lately? I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Obviously not on Roman flesh. Peter is amazed and the disciples are that the Spirit of God is falling on Romans who trust in Christ. Sometime later, Peter, this wonderful apostle, is dressed down in Galatians by the Apostle Paul for conveniently eating only with the Jews when the Jews are in town, ignoring the Gentiles that he used to eat with. The church throughout the ages has waffled here. The age of Western colonialism used the very command of Christ to reach the world, oftentimes as a divine mandate, as a tool to subjugate other people groups, to silence the foreign tongue. Historian Ralph Bauer describes the Franciscan missionaries as having been unequivocally committed to Spanish imperialism, condoning the violence and coercion of the conquest as the only viable method of bringing American natives, catch this, under the saving rule of Christianity. A man thought to be the father of modern post-colonial thought, Edward Said, gives us these eye-opening statistics. In 1800, Western Europeans held approximately 35% of the Earth's surface. By 1874, they owned 67% of the Earth's surface. By 1914, European nations held 85% of the Earth as colonies, protectorates, dependencies, dominions, and commonwealths. Wow! Eventually, many of those beautiful native tongues, the tongues of Pentecost, were replaced with the languages of the colonists, English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, German, and the like. And while colonialism may have often been masked as obedience to the Great Commission, Thankfully, much of the world now sees that era as errant. Wasn't that clever, era, errant? Go ahead and write that down. I'll wait. Going into the world to dominate it, to possess it, to plunder it, and not bringing the wonders of God in native tongues. The language of Pentecost was hardly a Christ-honoring move. It is true that much of the ethnic and religious violence and hatred in the world today stems from the age of imperial colonialism. I was amazed as I studied this to find out that so many of those nations and people groups have gained independence since World War II, rarely resulting in peace, I might add. The refreshing and somewhat new post-colonial voices are beginning to rise and bring the gospel back to us. And while we hear Jesus, Peter, and the prophet say, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters, old and young, Christ's spirit is still speaking to us. And I will close with a reflection on the fire. You all have some fire hanging over your head. Be careful. When Isaiah was taken up to see God, his first reaction was one of woe. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people with unclean lips. And then the seraphim takes, takes a coal off the altar and touches his lips with it and says, Your iniquity... Your sin is taken away and forgiven. Perhaps that is what we need. Perhaps we need an angel to take away our unclean lips with a coal from God's altar. To take away the voices that still speak in God's name but speak with prejudiced tones. Perhaps we need the fire to purify our hearts and our words that we might join 
the church of Pentecost and proclaim God's magnificent deeds in the tongues of the nations with honor, with respect, with inclusion of the outsider into the body of Christ. This, I think, is the miracle of Pentecost. And with that, I will say, Amen.